This is um, VRGF funded research that I'm talking about today. Thank you to the VRGF for this. Um, the, the team involved is, uh, so I led this project as an ECR grant. Um, Eric Langham and BJ Rowart over here uh, were involved as well and, and my boss, Nerali Hing, um, mentored the project. The research has now been published. Um, it came out in August last year, the, the whole report, and we're starting to, um, to throw out a whole bunch of papers um, from this as well. So one's been published so far and I'll start to, I'll show you at the end um, some analyses for the next one that's coming um, as well. All of that's um, freely available to you, including the paper. It's in the Journal of Behavioural Addictions. I'll show you that at the end. Um, so just a disclosure as well, um, I have previously received a little bit of industry funding for some work um, looking at um, problem gambling um, amongst casino employees. It's not something that I do anymore, but I feel it's one of those things that we disclose um, these days. So I'm not interested in industry funding anymore. Um, but most of my funding has come from um, government agencies um, across Australia. Um, so the idea for this is uh, of looking at the social networks of gamblers. People get confused about social networks a little bit. They start thinking of Facebook and Twitter. That's not really what this is about. Um, it's about <coughs> understanding people's social connections to each other and how that influences people's behaviour. <coughs> so the great quote that I love is that people are connected and their behaviour is connected. We tend to look at individuals when we do gambling research um, and, and research in general and understand you know, individual things that are happening for those individuals. Um, but we wanted to start looking at people as groups and understanding how you know, intergroup influences start um, uh, influencing people's behaviours. Um, social influences you know, influences from other people are really powerful predictors of behaviour. Most research that's been done in this area is into sort of negative type behaviours. Um, so things like smoking, um, drinking, um, drugs, um, and, and also things like food intake as well. So if you hang out with other people who eat a lot of food, you tend to eat more as well, leads to obesity and things like that. But social influences can also be used for good too. So social influences can uh, influence things like exercise, for example. So you know, this is something that, um, that I want you to start thinking about, how we can use some of the social um, connection findings in here to help reduce gambling as well, not just understand how it increases gambling and gambling harm, but how we can use it in the future to try and change gambling behaviours. Um, now we see, you know, that social influences are recognised in models such as the theory of planned behaviour. So this, this basically says that three things, attitudes, subjective norms and perceived behavioural control, all drive intention to um, conduct a behaviour and intention is related to the behaviour itself. Now social influences can influence all of these left hand circles. So my attitudes towards a particular behaviour can be influenced by the attitudes of other people around me to that behaviour, which also ties in with subjective norms um, and also perceived behavioural control. Social influences you know, uh, are a really powerful thing here and not something that's been looked at a lot in gambling. Um, they can be active or passive influences as well. So active influences are, are someone coming up to you just going, come on, let's go have a bet. Or come on, I'll buy you a drink, just hang around a little bit longer. Or hey, would you like a smoke? But also more passive influences. So the influences of um, your parents, for example. People often do the kind of things that their parents do. Um, and, and just observing what is seen as normal. So this is this idea of social norms. Um, they're much more passive. That's just what you pick up from looking around you and seeing what other people do. Um, now, social connections also um, can form in a bunch of different ways. So I talked about parents there briefly. There's a lot of evidence out there to show that parental gambling behaviour and parental problems are really powerful predictors of your own gambling behaviour and your own gambling problems down the track. You generally don't get to choose your parents. Right? They're there from the start. Usually they hang around. Um, but other types of social connections can be chosen, can be you know, chosen into your networks. So you can choose who your friends are and you can choose which friends you no longer want to hang around with as well. And often these you know, changes in social connections are based on shared interests like gambling. Colleagues are kind of an interesting one as well and they form a separate group that we've looked at in this study too because you don't necessarily know who your colleagues are going to be when you go into a workplace but you often form interesting connections with them usually again based on shared experiences. So in our research we've, we've looked at the separate influences from parents and from friends and from colleagues to understand how they differ and in the end we basically have found that they don't differ very much. 
Um, so they can, yeah, social connections can be formed by chance, but usually there's some degree of social selection in there. Um, so I talked about what we can use these social in influences for or, or what they can do to us. They can change what we, what we perceive as normal and they can also change behaviour. So I've talked about um, uh, anti-alcohol norms here, but another great example is um, a lot of the change that's happened around smoking, um, for example. So there's no more smoking advertising on TV. There is a reduction in um, smoking being shown in TV shows plain packaging, there's a lot more stigma against smoking these days as well, and we're seeing a corresponding reduction in smoking behaviour. And a lot of that is through what's seen as normal. Smoking is now seen as fairly aberrant compared to what it looked like 20 years ago. And some of these things we can have more like active influences on. You know, some, uh, we can change these norms fairly quickly. So things like um, increasing taxes, making it harder to smoke, so that those who are still smoking really want to smoke. Um, and, and influencing smoke-free zones and things like that. In Sydney, we're starting to see a lot of pubs popping up where they're actively advertising that they don't have pokies. Um, and it's creating these family-friendly environments that people can go into, and there's, there's a big push against gambling um, in Sydney. You might have seen some of the, um, the things around the advertising on the Sydney Opera House sales um, last year about the horse race. They, they weren't actually advertising gambling, but they were advertising a horse race which is so tightly connected to gambling that everyone just thought it was gambling anyway. Um, there's a really big push against that. And that's starting to change what's seen as normal in society. But these changes are slow and they take time. So understanding social influences in gambling, the, the research that's around tends to focus on very young people who are just starting to be able to gamble. Um, you know, understanding what influences them up taking the behaviour. Um, or very old gamblers. Um, I'll talk about an example there in a second. Um, generally, the, uh, the use of social influences focuses on one-on-one -on -one type relationships, so parents to kids, um, you know, and not like a broader social group in general. Um, or they look at very distinct groups, like a workplace or a sporting group. You know, so it's very sort of narrowly defined at the moment. We've decided to go a lot broader than that. It's not necessarily social influences themselves that drive behaviour. Sometimes it's a lack of a social network that can drive behaviour as well, where gambling is an escape from boredom. Or you might go to the club where everybody knows your name um, and, and use gambling as an escape from that kind of um, loneliness. And we often see this in, uh, in older people in particular. Um, so mapping out social influences, um, normally social influences aren't just due to a single person, even though we often look at particular single people like parents and things. Um, but if we map out our social influences, I'm going to show you how we do that in a second, these social networks, we can identify key influences in a network as well, which can be really useful if you're trying to help a particular person get away from these, uh, these uh, issues. Um, so this is an example of a social network. Now, it looks crazy, but it's actually really quite simple. This is a political example from um, uh, one of the American elections back in 2004. The blue dots are Democratic websites, and the red dots are Republican websites. And they have a line between them if they are linking to each other, if they're connected. And so all of the blue ones are all connected to each other, and all of the red ones are all connected to each other. But there's not a lot of connections in the middle. There's a few, those yellow lines, right? So this gives you the picture of these two very distinct groups. And information can only flow between websites that are linking to each other. So all of the red sites, they're all talking about the same Republican issues. And all of the blue sites are all talking about the, the Democratic issues. And there's not a lot of interchange there. It's this idea of an echo chamber. Now, we can't really do that in gambling research because this requires us knowing who's connected to who and their level of gambling behaviour. This is what's called a socio-centric social network analysis. But the information that we need is not readily available. So we've had to do something a little bit different. We've done what's called an egocentric social network analysis. For each person, the ego, the red person in the middle, we ask them about the 20 most influential people in their lives. Um, I've just done five here just to, to demonstrate things. We ask them who they are, you know, their, their mum, their dad, their friend, their colleague, uh, how long they've known each other, how close they feel to that person, and is that person a gambler? Do they gamble together? Um, you know, a lot of information about these connections. Um, we then know a lot about how the ego and the alters, these are the influential people in their lives, are connected to each other. 
But the key thing is to understand how all the alters are connected to each other. So we then ask this person in the middle, okay, cool, your mum. Who out of these 19 other people that you told us about does she know? And we can draw lines between them like that. And we start getting diagrams like this where we can connect up the alters too. Now, because the ego by definition is attached to everyone in their network, we can just get rid of them and those lines. And we start to get this clear picture of distinct social circles. So this person has two distinct social circles in their network. And the only way that information can flow between these people is through the ego. So the ego can choose to be a particular type of person in this network and a separate type of person in that circle over there. They can be a gambler with these people, but choose not to gamble with those people. Or this might be their work um, group, and that might be their family, for example. And they can be, how many people have you know of someone who's like a real hard ass at work, but it, you know, their family tells them, oh no, you're just the nicest person in the world, and it seems really disparate? You can do that when your social circles don't overlap. You can be different people. Um, there's only one, uh, two previous studies on social networks in gambling and the, the one that was out at the time that we did this research was um, only studying 40 pathological gamblers, it's a very small sample. Um, but they basically found that, um, you know, though these people are surrounded by other gamblers um, and but, uh, they didn't really find any structural network differences between pathological gamblers and non-pathological gamblers. I mention that because we did and we think it's really important. So we studied about 800 people, about 160 each of them, uh, non-problem, low risk, moderate risk, and problem gamblers based on the PGSI. And we also had some non-gamblers in there to compare to. Um, we added some information on harms because I work with the harms guys, so we sort of had to do that. Um, and, and so it's a nice large sample, which gives us a lot more power to see some really cool stuff here. Uh, and we asked about 20 alters, 20 most influential people for each person. So we've got 784 people, and for each of those people, the 20 most influential people in their lives. We've got a lot of data. Basically, for you know, I've got a sense of how strongly connected people are to each other, um, and who's connected to who, and also who gambles and who's experienced harm. Um, so basically, we found that the egos who are in the higher risk groups, particularly the problem gamblers, um, tend, to be, uh, tend to surround themselves with people who are closer to them in terms of age. Not necessarily gender, but age. Um, they're surrounded by more gamblers and um, more people who've experienced gambling related harm. Let's put some numbers to it. So of the 20 most influential people in their lives, for non-gamblers, just a bit under four of those 20 people gamble. So, you know, non-gamblers hang out with other non-gamblers. It's not that surprising, right? For non-problem gamblers, it's about seven out of 20. And for problem gamblers, 13 out of the 20 most influential people in their lives gamble. And they tend to gamble with most of them as well, about 80% of them. So there's a lot of opportunities there for problem gamblers to gamble socially. When we look at how many of those people are harmed, which is the bottom green bit, about 60% of those 13 people on average around problem gamblers are experiencing gambling related harm. So on average, about seven and a half of the people around every problem gambler are experiencing harm and they gamble with them anyway. It doesn't matter. They gamble with, again, about 80% of those people who are experiencing harm. It extends beyond gambling as well. We see that, look, we're Australian. The green bars, everyone drinks. Right? But the black bars, we see it, um, a, a similar pattern with smoking behaviour as well. And, and we know that smoking and drinking and gambling are linked. It's not a surprise for everyone. But, but we also see that uh, amongst problem gamblers in particular, um, social smoking um, is influenced as well here. Um, we also found that we, we were kind of interested in whether problem gamblers, uh, and, and I hate the term, but I'm using it because it's PTSI, um, whether their networks differ compared to lower risk gamblers. Because we have this picture of, you know, problem gamblers who are experiencing problems and become socially isolated. People don't want to hang out with them. Um, and so we thought that, you know, maybe their networks consist of the kinds of people who can't get away from them so, so easily. So things like family and less friends, unless those friends gambled. And it didn't actually really make a difference. The proportion of friends and family and colleagues didn't really differ across the PGSI groups. But what we did find that was interesting was that problem gamblers felt closer to the people in their social networks than did any of the lower risk groups. There's a lot of potential reasons for this, probably because they've been accepted for who they are 
and they feel that you know this person is trusted, they, they know that I gamble and probably have some problems with gambling and they still accept me as a friend, so I feel close to that person. But we, we, we went into this thinking that there might be some issues around isolation or, or even problem gamblers not being able to give us 20 alters, 20 names, didn't happen. Um, they tend to gamble with most of their alters. Um, so there is that direct social influence as well. It's not just that everyone around them gambles. So, um, you know, there's that general normalizing influence, but they actually gamble with them too. And so they can probably egg them on during gambling sessions as well. Um, and despite experiencing gambling related harms, they experience with a lot, uh, they gamble with a lot of those people too. But what's really interesting is that it's going to be really hard to reduce these social influences. So this is an average social network diagram for a non-gambler. Remember the ego doesn't appear in here because they'd just be a shape connected to everyone else and it just looks really messy. Um, so we can see here that there's sort of like a bit of a distinct group of colleagues down here. They're maybe a little bit connected to some of the rest of the network, but there's sort of a distinctish group of colleagues, right? Um, the light blue is family. They're up here with a few close friends who know family as well. Um, and the big circles are gamblers. So for this person, um, the gambling is not coming from their family, at least at this time, um, but a couple of friends who are connected to family. And there's a few in the workplace there as well. Square means that they're harmed. That's a non-problem, uh, a non-gambler. Uh, for a non-problem gambler, this is what an average non-problem gambler looks like. Um, for this particular person, um, they're, you know, all of the gambling is happening in their family. So if they want to reduce their gambling, then they know exactly where the influences are coming from. They might go and spend more time with this group of friends up here who don't gamble at all. Um, and they're distinct from this group here. But this circle also allows them a social opportunity to be someone other than a gambler, to, to hang out with people who don't gamble. So we end up with these you know, pretty distinct groups though, right? Not everyone's really connected to everyone. It's possible to have these different social groups that you can hang out with. Our big finding here is that problem gamblers don't have that. In problem gamblers networks, everyone knows everyone, possibly because they all share a really similar um, you know, hobby here in, in gambling and drinking and smoking. So look at where this person's gamblers are, the big shapes and the harmed gamblers, the regular gamblers, and they're connected to everybody else as well. They're in their family, they're in their friends, they're in their colleagues. How does this person cut these social influences out of their life? Where do they go if they don't want to be a gambler? Who do they hang out with? Have to start making new friends. Now, as an adult, that's a really hard thing to do. Uh, but it, it highlights the issue. It's not just that those social influences are there, but it's that they're almost impossible to escape from. And this is your average problem gambler. For you know, um, uh, other problem gamblers in the sample, they are even much more interconnected. So you can't just cut people out of your life easily if you want to reduce these social influences. Importantly, we found some nice age and gender effects here. So this is um, PGSI. We found that these are males, tend to have higher problem gambling until about age 40. So I'm about due to come out of it right about now. Um, and this ties in nicely with harms and this idea of network density ties between each people. It seems that younger males have these networks where everyone knows everyone. So it seems to be a gendered and aged thing too. Um, so basically, you know, problem gamblers and, and high risk gamblers hang out with other people like them. And, and that's not surprising. That's pretty much the case for all humans. But it highlights this degree of, and it's tied in with other behaviours as well, but it highlights this degree of normalisation. So being surrounded by other gamblers normalises gambling, but what I think is really interesting and, and I don't think has been found elsewhere before is that the harm is also normalised. If we accept that being surrounded by other gamblers normalises gambling, then being surrounded by harmed gamblers must normalise harm as well. And that's what we're seeing here. Um, and these connections are strong and, and therefore really hard to break. Um, so we'd love to do some follow-up work on this. You know, this is a cross-sectional thing at this time where we're looking at the current state of play. But what it doesn't tell us is how these bonds form and how they can be broken um, or, or altered. So that's something that we'd love to look at down the track. Um, and uh, also studying which types of interventions might work here as well. This is the second major study on social influences in gambling using this kind of methodology. Um, I know how to do it, so feel free to give me some money and I'll do some more. Um, this is the report. Uh, it's available and um, I tend to write hopefully in an easy to read kind of way, not too dense. So feel free to um, download. And if you have any questions, do please feel free to email me as well. I love talking about this sort of stuff. 
Um, and this is the first paper that came out just before New Year's, um, which is basically the report as well. We're working on the next one, which is going to be that young male's finding. Um, this is me. I'm on Twitter. I tweet sometimes about gambling, sometimes about wine. Take your pick. Um, and, and thanks to everyone else for being involved.